So this is lecture six of ECE 2305. And so in today's lecture, what we're going to be talking about is the uh, part two of our transmission media, in particular, unguided transmission media. So what we're going to first talk about are frequencies and antennas. Okay? And I just want to emphasize, the like, I don't know why. I'm just repeating it because I'm not an English major. But what happens is, in the communications world, the plural of antennas is not antennae. In biology, yes. But in electrical engineering, it's antennas. I don't know why. We, there's probably a good explanation for that. But yeah, for a number of years, you know, I go around and say, I'm going to get my antennae out, and I'm going to like, do wireless experiments, not knowing that that's incorrect usage of that term. All right? But what we're going to talk about is this unguided transmission media, and we're going to touch upon four applications. We're going to talk about microwave transmission, which is a great point-to-point -point technology. We're then going to talk about satellite comms. Oh, I love satellite comms. Broadcast radio, sure, you're going to be doing it in your experiment starting this Friday. In infrared, if any of you have a remote, right, change, change a channel and all that, or a Roku, that, you're probably playing with that technology. Then we're going to go into the physics of wireless transmission. And there's a lot of physics involved, but not too, we're not going to use too much math, I promise. All right, so I just talked about this. We have two types of antennas. We have the directional antennas, and we have the uh, omnidirectional antennas. So directional antennas, the energy that I use to transmit my signal as well as to receive is focused in one particular azimuth, in one direction only, and it kind of ignores all other signals that are coming at it from other directions. Omni means that it is equally receptive of picking up signals and equally powerful in all directions when transmitting. That, that's an omnidirectional antenna. And so there are some advantages and disadvantages for omni versus directional. If you want to only transmit information to one person, perhaps you are like, you know, some, you know, Department of Defense organization and you're doing something covertly, and that's why, you know, there's some projects out there, the Department of Defense projects that are looking at like, for instance, visible light communications and the like, because it's very difficult to detect unless you are the recipient. You want something very directional and not interfere with anybody else or other people picking you up. We call that LPD, LPI, low probability of detection, low probability of interference. On the other hand, if you are a radio broadcaster, you may want to let everybody get that commercial rich broadcast, right? And so it's all, really all about radiation patterns. So let me, let me, let me explain what, how radiation looks to me. Because I can see radiation. I'm not sure if you guys can. I see dead people. No, just kidding. I don't see dead people. So, so, oh, God. So, it's just Tuesday. Um, so, what happens is, usually when people draw radiation patterns, what happens is, you know, here's zero degrees. We also can consider this to be zero radians, right? And what we want to do is, let's say we have an omnidirectional antenna. So we want to see how the energy is projected in the xy plane. All right? We know that there's also a third dimension, which I'll try and draw to the best of my ability. Right? So actually, let's look at, so let me draw how the radiation off of this antenna looks like. So in the xy plane, an omnidirectional antenna will look like this. So we call this a radiation pattern. In 3D, how does this guy look like? So now here's my real drawing skills. In 3D, what this guy's going to look like is something called an annulus. What he's going to look like is a donut, basically. Oh, not bad so far. <laughs> and then, ah, yeah, I'm doing pretty well. Oh, yeah, okay, almost. Something like that. So what happens is the radiation is emanating 
equally around this antenna, but the vertical direction up and down has no energy propagating from it. All right? And that's just the physics of this antenna. This guy on your hand might have a very different property in terms of the vertical component. And what that means is, if I, I'm trying to listen for electromagnetic sources, and let's say my hand over here, my right hand, is emanating, and this antenna here is listening, perfect. In the XY plane, it should hear it clearly, right? But suppose now my source is up here, right? Where the radiation from this is emanating, and it's coming down on the antenna in that blind spot. What ends up happening is this guy won't hear a thing. It's turning a deaf ear, if you will, to that radiation source, right? So what happens is there is a third dimension. Most people, when they look at antennas, assume a two-dimensional world. If it's three-dimensional, things get a little tricky. How about a directional antenna? A directional antenna, on the other hand, so we take the ridged horn antenna there. Suppose we have a 60 degree sector. Okay? So only can listen, ah, it only can listen to things within that 60 degree range. What it will look like is something like this. That's basically it. So if you have a source. That's here. So let's say that's your radiation source, and it's emanating. It can be picked up. But if you have another source, let's say we call this source B, and it's, and it's emanating, again, it's like the blind spot. It's almost like I have something like with my ears. I'm looking in this, the forward direction, but if anyone's talking or there's any noises behind me, I can't hear it. So very much the same with the ridged horn. So you just draw a straight line from the source to the origin and if it crosses over that gate. Yep, exactly. So this radiation pattern, exactly. Because what happens is, assuming that the source is producing energy in all directions, there will be a, there, it, in this case, it does have a path, a direct path, into that region that that antenna is receptive to, and it will pick it up. Excellent question. So we refer to these things as radiation patterns, and also the opposite is true. If this antenna is broadcasting, suppose that's, that source is no longer a source but a sink or a destination, it is also in the transmission path. It will pick it up, while the guy behind will not. All right. So, like we saw a few lectures ago with respect to spectrum, electromagnetic spectrum, there are certain ranges of spectrum of frequency that have, you know, particular characteristics. For omnidirectional antennas or omnidirectional applications like AM radio, FM radio, Wi-Fi and the like, and even Wi-Fi is so-so. Uh, we usually like to do Omni applications in 30 megahertz to 1 gigahertz. The only thing is, you might think of Wi-Fi 2.4 gigahertz or 5 gigahertz. And sure enough, like those are above the 1 gigahertz. So we can still pull it off. But ideally, 1 gigahertz is nice in terms of the frequency characteristics to broadcast within a region om omnidirectionally. And then 1 to 40, we refer to as microwave frequencies. So these guys here, we can use very directional. So for instance, there are a couple of standards that do microwave point to point. We'll talk about one of those in a few minutes. And what happens is, in those cases, we use antennas similar to the ridged horn to send a signal, microwave link, to another receiving antenna that's also a horn and to pick it up. So you might say, what's a horn? A horn, essentially, this guy has a particular architecture, right? But in general, a horn has a very wide aperture at the front, and then as you progressively go to the cavity, 
it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. It essentially compresses all the energy, funnels it to the cavity. So you'll see horn antennas. This one's kind of interesting because the sides are open. It doesn't really matter. But um, a good example of horn antennas, I haven't seen any recently. If I can find the address, I'll send it to everyone. But uh, yeah, when I was growing up, police stations actually would have horn antennas. So what they would look like are kind of like these big white versions. I mean huge, like it would be my size and such. And there would be multiple, multiple horns on top of a single, um, single platform pointing at all directions within a city. So yes? Exactly. So everyone's homework today is to go home, take, take apart a microwave. No, that's exactly, well, that's exactly the point. And you know what's kind of interesting? And might be actually, would it be, would you be able, you guys be able to pick it up? Not with the RTL SDR. Is because, guess what frequency those microwave ovens are operating at? Sure, but any particular frequency? 2.4 to 2.5 gigahertz. What else? Uh, what also operates at 2.4 to 2.5 gigahertz? Wi-Fi. Wi so that's why it's considered like you know a free band. Anybody can use it for uh, you know Wi-Fi or other unlicensed applications because microwave ovens also operate in that. So that's an excellent point, Andrew. Like with respect to microwave ovens, have I forgot what the exact term is, but essentially it's a horn antenna that's blasting your meal, whether it's reheating a pizza, mmm, pizza. But, but what ends up happening, what's kind of interesting, is that at that particular frequency, that excites water, and that's where you're getting that heating sensation of your meal, right? And what's kind of interesting is if you rip off the shielding of your microwave oven and you monitor the sort of the time and frequency progression of the energy, what essentially your microwave oven is doing is it's sweeping from 2.4 to 2.5 gigahertz and bombarding your meal with that energy. So, so it does from 2.4 and steps all the way to 2.5 and then repeats. That's why it's kind of a problem if you don't have appropriate shielding and you have Wi-Fi because what essentially your microwave oven is doing is it's jamming. That's a great point. So, but the only thing is I wouldn't take a part of microwave oven. So I'm joking, I'm joking. Okay. The higher frequencies that you have there, that's more for infrared applications, so like your remote controls and such. So let's, let's again, let's revisit the, um, that, that um, spectrum chart. Do, 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 do. So if we go back to potpourri, <laughs> and we go to the US spectrum chart. So again, the, the, you know, the, the fed, they're actually, it's kind of interesting. In the United States, there are actually two federal organizations that handle frequency allocation. So you have the uh, FCC, so Federal Communications Commission. So um, if I'm not mistaken, it's an executive office. So, um, so it, what it does is it's responsible for handling everything non-governmental in terms of spectrum allocation and management. So what happens is if uh, AT&T or Verizon or any one of these commercial guys, amateur radio operators and all these guys want access to spectrum or there's an issue with interference from other users and such, you go to the FCC. But for federal organizations like military and others, you go through de a Department of Commerce uh, um, um, organization called the NTIA. Okay? So anything governmental. So let's say Department of Defense, some, they need to use spectrum for something, something, something that is something, something classified, something, something between this time and that time. You would go through the NTIA rather than the FCC. Okay? So what happens is the United States, as far as I'm aware of, is the only, um, only uh, country that has two regulators rather than the one. Okay? So what happens is you can actually look at the, how the frequencies are allocated. Um, one in particular, let me find it if it's here. Do we have it? Come on. Gigahertz. So I'm looking for 70 to 90 gigahertz. Oh, there we go. I think that's it. Yes. So 70 to 90 gigahertz. So that, that's over there. Hmm. I'm not sure if it's showing. 
But one thing that's kind of interesting, so that's in between the microwave range and the infrared range. So that's millimeter wave. So that's another application. Uh, not a lot of folks are looking at it right now, but it has a lot of potential because you can support 10 gigahertz of bandwidth downlink and 10 gigahertz of bandwidth uplink. What's really nice about that spectrum, it's, it's massive bandwidth, but the problem is, just like with a few other frequencies in the microwave range, water absorption. So if there's rain, if there's mist, if there's fog, and you'd be amazed, the size and shape of a raindrop can influence the connectivity of your channel. So if it's a very big raindrop, usually it has a teardrop shape. That could cause more interference than, let's say, small raindrops. And let's say something in Seattle, where it's raining constantly, but it's a light mist type of rain, might not influence these signals as much as something like a good downpour somewhere in like Alabama or Mississippi, right? Which has a lot of rain. OK. So that's really, like, you know, with electromagnetic energy and such, we can break it up into those, into those three categories. And then from there, we need antennas that can receive that energy. And so we talked about the transmission antennas and how they're supposed to radiate energy. And we talked about directional and omnidirectional. So uh, we can either tr transmit all this energy down one path, or we can send it all over the place, right? And reception, the exact opposite. We either receive from all directions, or we want to be really focused at one particular direction of interest. But there's one term that we always talk about when we refer to antennas, and that, it's, that is its antenna's gain. It's how much information, I mean, sorry, how much the signal strength, how strong it is um, in a specific direction. How, like, how much do we intercept or send a signal in one direction versus another? And that was the radiation pattern that I was talking about. And that is totally dependent on the characteristics of physical shaping and the trickery that those antenna designers do with the actual, with the actual mechanism itself. One thing we do is we always talk about when we refer to antenna gain, we always refer to it in dB or decibels, which if it's power is 10 log 10, and then whatever the, um, you know, the, the, the gain is in whatever unit. Actually, it should be unit list. Whenever, so one thing I, I have to bring up is uh, when you do the de decibel of anything, when you take, the, like you take the 10 log 10, it should never have any units. Okay, this is the one thing, if you ever take the decibel of something, if you take 10 log 10, it should always be a ratio. If, if you see something, there's volts or hertz or something, something's wrong. It should always be done, it should always be um, a ratio. So, okay, enough of, like, you know, talking about odds and ends. Let's talk about the cool stuff. Let's talk about applications. So we're going to talk about, first, terrestrial microwave transmission. It's kind of cool, kind of useful. Some telephone companies use it. And then we're going to talk about all exciting satellite comms. And you might say, who does satellite anymore? Well, you know, satellite's actually really cool. Have any of you seen GoldenEye? You know, like you then you know, send that code up to that satellite and then begins destroying things. Oh, yes, world domination. Then we'll talk about broadcast radio. And I, mean, I use that in a very general term, an infrared. So, so first of all, terrestrial microwave transmission, so that... What this guy does is essentially what you have is it supports point-to-point -point communications between, let's say, two campuses or maybe two buildings that are relatively far apart. Usually it uses frequencies between 2 gigahertz and 40 gigahertz. So whenever you go on a building, so for instance, like uh, at University of Kansas, when I was on top of the res hall over there, so it's on top of this hill, and you can't beat it. So you're traveling on I-70. You're approaching Lawrence, Kansas, and the first thing you see is like the main building, if you will, like the equivalent of Boynton Hall or Alden Hall, and it's on top of the hill, one of the few hills in Kansas, right? And then after that, you see three ginormous residence halls, right? And on top of one is this humongous parabolic dish, and that was used um, by, I believe it's like a, a, a Civic Air Patrol for Kansas. And so what happens is, what this guy did essentially was, I, I believe, the, the building itself had uh, some sort of network connectivity, and then that directional antenna was used because it's the highest point within the region, easily. It broadcasts information 
to a fixed location somewhere else, like let's say National Guard post or something of that nature. What's interesting with microwave transmission, first of all, it's fixed. So you won't be driving a car and you have this humongous parabolic dish on top and you're picking up a night, another microwave transmission somewhere. This is meant to be point to point. And what's kind of interesting is that the distances, the transmission distances can be so long that you might be beaten out by the curvature of the Earth. So what do I mean by that? So microwave works by transmitting in line of sight. And that term is going to come up very soon, too. Like, I'll explain what that is. So here's the curvature of the Earth. So suppose, even on a hill, I have a transmitter. And this is where I want, so transmitter, receiver. Unfortunately, microwave transmission does not do this. It does not curve with the Earth, right? And if you just broadcast it straight, it goes out into space and the Martians get it. So what you want is something like this. You want to send point to point. So we call this a line of sight or LOS link. And then it repeats. Line of sight link. It repeats line of sight. So what happens is this is done every 20 to 30 miles. So it retransmits, 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 retransmits that information until it gets to its destination. All of this done in microwaves. Okay. So as a result, like you know, whatever information that you need to communicate, you would use this. And 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 so like for instance. Uh, some type of network. So let's say if you have a cellular network, or suppose you have something here, some sort of information that you need to communicate. Let's say that's Lawrence, Kansas, and you want to transmit it to, what's 50, 60 miles? Kansas City. Kansas City, Missouri. And so what you would have is several of these links because the curvature of the Earth blocks direct line of sight. Discard, even though that's a cool drawing, discard. So what ends up happening is when you have that microwave link, you need to have that unobstructed line of sight. And there are a variety of different applications, including like long haul telecommunications, voice, television. Like in the old days, like let's say if you have AT&T and you want to send service out to this remote region and have a, a, a base station there. Uh, you would have these microwave links to provide that service. It has wide enough bandwidth. Ah, okay. And there's a variety of disadvantages, but the line of sight is the most, the most uh, problematic. There are other things like the tower has to be tall, the repeaters are expensive, there's interference. Like the worst thing is, is if you have something cutting in front of that line of sight. It's like, oh, sorry, you lost signal just for that split second. But other things like supporting wide bandwidth transmissions and stuff is just great. So this is this here, actually, I'm going to spend a little bit more time talking about because I do have an active project with NASA right now that talks all about this. You might think satellite's dead. Absolutely not. Satellite is so cool. And the reason satellite is so cool is because of its ex uh, we can using satellite, we can access internet anywhere around the planet, right? And so what, what's happening is there's a rebirth in satellite, even though the initial costs are quite prohibitive. You need a space program. You need rockets. You have to put a payload. The chances of that payload blowing up because the rocket like, you know, had a malfunction is pretty bad. But for the most part, you know, most people have gotten satellite payload development down you know, pretty pat. We even have now private companies like SpaceX that are launching satellites up, you know, and beating out the NASA and the European Space Agency, the, um, the, the Russians at their own game, right, at a fraction of the cost. And so what's really nice about satellite communications, especially if you've got a lot of money, is you can cover the whole planet with a network of these guys. Okay? And I'll bring up an example of exactly what I'm talking about. So how does satellite communications work? Ah, drawing time again. <laughs> So the way SATCOM works 
is here's, here's our planet, okay? And you have something called a ground station. Okay? Ground station. Again, parabolic antenna most times. In fact, on Ackwater Kent, on this building, let me see if you can see it from here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> when you're leaving, uh, uh, next to the windmill on the left, there's actually the satellite antenna. So we had a project um, about 15 years ago. Professor Luft advised it with MITRE. So they did a... Um, they did a satellite tracking system for the, for the satellite, the, um, I think it's called a mini sat, that's down in the pumpkin lounge. So there's an actual satellite. They launched into space and came back down. It's in the glass, plexiglass container. Uh, the antenna that's on the roof next to the windmill, so it looks kind of like this, but it actually has this and these types of elements. So that's a satellite antenna. I don't know what the exact frequencies are but some of my students have played with it as well. So on your way out, check out the antennas outside, okay? But what ends up happening is your ground station, just like that guy over there, talks with an antenna that's in space. You know, here's the solar panels, right? And so, so what happens is you have the uplink or forward direction, and you have the downlink. Okay, or reverse direction. And the way it works is that the satellite can maintain a fixed position relative to the Earth's surface, in which we call it geostationary, or we can also have, intent, uh, we can have satellites that move pretty fast and have an orbit around the Earth, and we call those low, low Earth orbit, or LEO satellites, of which the International Space Station is one of them. It also has a radio that you can communicate with. So, what happens is the way satellite communications is you either have a ground station and you can broadcast it to, to that and from that satellite, and at the same time, this satellite, depending on the size of the parabolic dish, can also project information. So let's say instead of a ground station, or maybe it has another antenna, can project on a surface of the Earth. We call this a footprint. So if you want direct TV for North America, it projects onto that part of the Earth. So, so satellites can either maintain that orbit, like the fixed position, they can uh, rotate around the Earth, and they can access the Earth with, let's say, a ground station, or and at the same time project information down on a surface to, let's say, multiple receivers like your DISH TV. So that's the radiation pattern that projects down onto the surface. <laughs> now, what ends up happening is that you can do television, you can do long distance telephone transmission. Some of the earlier satellites was actually pretty cool. One of the first satellites was, I think it was a 10 story tall Mylar balloon. And what the folks did is they just bounced the radiation off of it across the Atlantic to a receiver at the other end. And that's all they did. It's like, let's inflate a balloon in space, and we just angle our transmission just right. It ricochets the energy down to the other side of the planet. Okay? Very simple. But s satellites have become more sophisticated. So what I was talking about before, in terms of like, you know, investments, so several companies like Iridium, Global Star, and Inmarsat have put entire cellular, like the concept of cellular base stations, but into space. They have networks of 40, 50, or 60 satellites out there doing all the digital signal processing. And what happens is you have this phone with a humongous antenna, and anywhere around the planet you will have satellite phone access, right? And everything, all the signal processing, all the routing, all the information sharing is all done in space. And that's quite beautiful because imagine you're in a natural disaster area or a military operation. Everything is done in space away from, you know, Earth down below. And whenever you talk to someone in the satellite world, you'll hear the following. So if someone says, oh, are you transmitting in KA? Oh, is that an S-band transmission? Oh, well, is that KU? There's a few that I have not indicated here, uh, such as X-band and such. But when someone talks like that, 
they're referring to a specific range of frequencies. S band is very beautiful because if you notice, that's in like, you know, a little higher than two gigahertz, which means that it's not too susceptible to rain and fading and all these bad stuff that could attenuate the signal. KA band, on the other hand, nobody's transmitting in KA band or very few applications, but at those frequencies, rain showers can bring down the link. Just like if any of you have satellite TV, can you watch the game with rain outside? No, right? So you should be aware that, you know, the satellite community have some lingo. Oh, that's KA band, that's KU band, that's S band, that's C band, that's X band. What happens is they speak this language as a shorthand for which bands they're operating in. And the disadvantages and the advantages are, again, like you have that great reach and high bandwidth, but uh, one bad thing about satellite that I didn't talk about is the propagation delay. The amount of, in, amount of time it takes to send a signal into space and then to retransmit it somewhere else on the planet. It's like, how do you reach your nose? This way, please. You know, it takes a long time relative to the rate of information. Just a little bit about radio broadcasts and infrared. So what ends up happening is, um, again, we have FM, we have TV transmissions and such. And that's usually done in 3 kilohertz to uh, 300 gigahertz. But in particular, broadcast radio is done up to about a gigahertz. And that, again, requires line of sight. Um, and we might not see the TV tower or the FM transmitter and such, but it's there. Like there's one, I think, in Boylston. That's pretty close by. And then infrared, on the other hand, again, um, does, requires line of sight and uses a lot of reflection. Okay. Last but not least, the physics of wireless propagation. So signals can either hug the surface of the Earth. They can bounce off the, uh, the atmosphere, and there's line of sight. So what, what do I mean? So here's, wow. so here's the Earth's surface. We can have ground waves, and those electromagnetic signals do hug the Earth. We also have layers in the atmosphere, and we can bounce signals off of that. We call those sky waves. And then, of course, we have the line of sight transmissions. So we have these three types of wireless signals. And what ends up happening is they each use a different type of application. Sky wave, in particular, amongst other types of signals, like let's say world services, amateur radios and stuff, military loves sky wave. Because if you're trying to get to troops on the other side of the planet, boop, boop. And ground waves also has its nice features as well. And then the rest is physics. So what we're going to do is we're going to end things off with explaining what I mean by the physics. So in this room, just like in high school physics, you have essentially a source and you have a sink. And you have the line of sight component of radiation and on top of that, your radiation emanates and reflects and gets absorbed by the wall, it gets absorbed by the tiles, it gets absorbed by the floor, it gets absorbed by all of you. So what ends up happening is it bounces off the walls and some of that energy gets kept by the walls and makes it weaker. The phase changes. And what happens is these multiple copies of the signal get received by something like that Wi-Fi access point from your laptops. Sometimes they're not aligned properly. Sometimes they destructively combine. We call this multipath. When we have multiple paths of energy bouncing all over the place. So even in this room, if I transmit, that Wi-Fi access point is picking up multiple copies of me. Heaven forbid. And what happens is those multiple copies could constructively or destructively combine. And also what's kind of cool is unless you're playing in water or maybe some other type of material, what happens is speed of electromagnetic energy travels at the speed of light, 3 times 10 to the 8. And so what happens is we actually get some of, like, you know, in free space we call that air and, and the like. And atmosphere does absorb 
certain types of energy at different frequencies, like water absorption is greatest at 22 gigahertz, and oxygen actually absorbs at uh, around 60 gigahertz, and fog and others actually uh, have some uh, influence as well. Okay, and I already drew the multipath propagation. So that is lecture six of ECE 2305. All right, thank you folks. Don't forget Quiz Thursday. Woo!